Okay. It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. On Friday, I had a chance to meet with workers at GM as they came on to shift. They took a big hit last week, Speaker, but they know that they have the skill and talent to build some of the best cars in the world, even if government the government side, party doesn't door. seem to think so. And they want to fight GM's decision to shut down operations in Oshawa. Their question to me was, why is the government so determined to throw in the towel? Can the Deputy Premier tell us? Deputy Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly, uh, when Premier Ford was there, when this uh, first occurred, he acknowledged, uh, immediately acknowledged, that it is a difficult time for workers at General Motors uh, Oshawa assembly plant and uh, for the thousands of workers uh, at hundreds of auto plant uh, parts suppliers across Ontario uh, and their families and their friends. And it is disappointing uh, that GM failed to see the competitive advantage that Oshawa's highly trained staff brought to the operations in Oshawa. Now, of course, GM says that this move is part of a global restructuring, and that is why we need to make sure, Speaker, that the world knows Response. that after 15 years of job-killing policies, that Ontario is open for business. Yeah. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, there's a huge amount at stake here. GM employs thousands of people directly, but there are thousands more who work in companies that supply GM. And notwithstanding the government not allowing me to get my question out, municipal and business leaders are estimating that the ripple effect could lead to 20,000 job losses in Oshawa and the Durham region. The Premier may be resigned to letting those jobs go to Mexico and China, but we think that they're worth fighting for. At a time when people in Oshawa are looking for leadership, Speaker, why is this government throwing in the towel? Minister. Speaker, uh, we have authorized the Premier Ford immediately authorized Employment Ontario to deploy our Mr. rapid reemployment and training services program to provide impacted local workers with targeted local training and job services to help them regain employment as quickly as possible. We've also asked the federal government to immediately extend uh, employment insurance eligibility to ensure the impacted workers in the auto sector can fully access EI benefits when they need them the most, uh, and to work with their U.S. counterparts, uh, Speaker, to remove all tariffs uh, that are impacting auto parts suppliers, so that we can remain competitive in the Oshawa assembly as the Oshawa assembly plant closes its Response. doors. Response. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, what they told me is that they want good jobs and they want their government to fight for those That's good right. jobs. Over decades, the people of Oshawa have built a world-class auto industry, a university that produces cutting-edge research and technology, and a skilled workforce that is second to none. General Motors might think that they can walk away from that, but the Premier's job is to tell them that they're wrong and use every tool at his disposal to keep those jobs in Oshawa and keep work in that community. Why is the government so determined to side with GM's plan to abandon Oshawa? Members, please take your seats. Minister. Uh, speaker, we've been working since day one to reverse 15 years of bad policies. Now, I appreciate the uh, uh, leader's comments, but the NDP continue to want the highest carbon tax in the world. Okay. They want Ontario to be a place where it's unaffordable to make cars, unaffordable to buy cars, and unaffordable to drive cars. So when the NDP Member come in here and, and say they're fighting for the workers, we know two things. One, Falls, they order. don't have a plan, and two, their policies policies would kill the automotive sector, Speaker. Uh, now, I can appreciate the uh, leader is here to make her comments, but it did take her almost a week to get to the plant, and she did refuse a briefing by our uh, Minister uh, Smith. 
Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also to the Acting for Premier. King Bond, really come should Lord. understand the for that 70% of GM's new investment is going to be in green cars, for speaker, King Bond is in born. electric vehicles and in uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. But this is a question for the Acting Premier regarding leadership and the Premier's standards for his staff. On Friday, Ali Kinvelshi worked his last day as an executive at Ontario Power Generation. He was fired and given up to half a million dollars in severance wow. in what uh, he called quote-unquote, unusual circumstances. Will the government finally admit that those unusual circumstances were that the Premier's Chief of Staff, Dean French, called OPG to demand that he be fired after a single day on the job? Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Hydro One is responsible for its own uh, staffing decisions and they've made their own staffing decisions, and uh, we respect that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, on Friday, the Globe and Mail reported that, once again, the Premier's Chief of Staff was intervening in the electricity sector, this time to land a job for Anthony Haynes, the former CEO of Toronto Hydro, a man who the Premier just happened to work closely with for many years. Can the government tell us what the Premier's Chief of Staff is up to these days? <laughs> Minister. Well, as I said uh, previously, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One is responsible for their own hiring decisions. Following years of outrageous Liberal scandals Order. and $6 million salaries, the Government for the People has taken measures to improve accountability and transparency at Hydro One. This includes a legislative provision to approve a responsible and reasonable compensation package for the CEO and the Board Selects, which we will proceeding with, be proceeding with in the near future. Thank you. Uh, final supplementary. Well, it sounds like it depends on what kind of a people you are. If you're a friend that Doug Ford's, you get a job, and if you're not a friend, you lose a job. Interview. Inter I'm ask the leader of the opposition to refer to the premier by, by his uh, ministerial title, by premier. Uh, speaker, the. Um, the fact of the matter is that intervening in the hiring process is actually a violation of the government's agreement with Hydro One. Uh, that is the reality, especially if he's intervening to land a job for an associate of the Premier's. Why is the Premier's Chief of Staff, Dean French, intervening in this process? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Following uh, years of outrageous Liberal scandals and uh, the $6 million salary of its former president and CEO, Opposition the government order. for the people has taken measures to improve accountability and order. transparency at Hydro One. This includes a legislative provision to approve a responsible and reasonable compensation package framework uh, for the CEO and those boards, uh, board of directors selected. And we're proceeding uh, with that now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, speaker, my next question is also to the uh, Acting Premier, but I have to say, after years of scandals, Ontarians certainly deserve much better than more of the same. That's right. Look, Mr. Haynes had a troubling record at Toronto Hydro, pushing privatization while his salary grew 32 per cent uh, to $1.1 million a year. And the Premier, then a Toronto councillor, was his staunch defender. Does the Acting Premier think this is appropriate uh, for the Premier's Chief of Staff to meddle in the hiring process to get Mr. Haynes a job? Deputy Premier. Minister of Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a private corporation, the Board of Hydro One is responsible for their own hiring decisions. Following years of outrageous Liberal scandals and $6 million salary for its uh, CEO, the Government for the People uh, has taken measures to improve accountability and transparency Opposition at Hydro order. One. And this includes a legislative provision to approve a responsible and a reasonable compensation framework for the CEO and the Board of Directors selected, which we are proceeding with now as we speak. Thank you, Mr. Well Speaker. Said. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the people of Ontario want to know that when it comes to important positions like this one, that the person was, that's hired was the, actually the best person for the job, not the best friend of the Premier. Why is the Premier's <laughs> Chief of Staff meddling in the hire, hiring process to get Mr. Haynes the job? 
Minister. It was uh, abundantly clear that uh, a government for the people needed to take measures to improve transparency and accountability at Hydro One, and we move forward with a legislative position for to approve door. a responsible and reasonable compensation package for the CEO and the board selected. But you want to talk about a political party who really wanted to get involved in the operational decisions of a company? Talk about part of their campaign platform to cancel 7,000 jobs in the beautiful riding of Pickering, o Oxbridge, Mr. Speaker. That's not a decision made available to that leader, and it wouldn't have been had she become Premier. We stood up for those workers. We stood up for an asset that provides 60 per cent of Ontario's hydro, and we're going to do that every single day, Mr. Speaker. Members take their seats. Next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my uh, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's government for the people was elected with a mandate to improve public safety across this province and to improve the to provide the brave men and women of our police services with the tools and resources they need to perform their duties safely and effectively. After 15 years of liberal neglect, our government is making investments in the key priority of keeping communities safe. Earlier this year, our government announced a $182 million investment to replace aging OPP facilities with nine new detachments province-wide. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please update the members of this legislature on how these new OPP detachments will improve public safety in, in Ontario? Oh, sure. Community safety and correctional services. Thank you so much. No, I, I really appreciate the question from the member from Perth Wellington because I know that he understands how important public safety is to our communities and to our communities. It was a great, uh, great pleasure, actually, on Friday to go to Clinton and join my friend and colleague, the Minister of Education and uh, the Minister of Infrastructure, to announce Clinton's new OPP detachment. Thank you. Thank you. It will ensure that our frontline officers have the resources they need to do their job to serve their community. The, the, the infrastructure is going to make a real difference to the community of Huron, and I was just pleased to be part of it this, on uh, Friday. So thank you so much. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, for that answer. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, for that answer and for your continued advocacy when it comes to ensuring the safety of our province. Here, here. Projects like the new OPP detachments are key to ensuring the safety of our province and providing much-needed support to our brave men and women in uniform. For far too long, it seemed that the, wherever you would go in our province, the key government buildings and infrastructure projects would be left in a state of uh, disrepair. Could the minister elaborate on the role that the Minister of Infra Infrastructure played regarding the impact that infrastructure projects like this will have for our communities like Clinton and across the province? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank uh, the member of Perth Wellington for his strong leadership uh, in, in these projects and others. Uh, Mr. Speaker, infrastructure for the people means giving our police forces, including the brave men and women of the OPP, the tools they need to keep all of our communities safe. I was pleased to join the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services and the Minister of Education in announcing a $20 million investment in a new OPP oh, detachment wow. in Clinton, Ontario. I would also like to thank the Bird Construction Crew for working with the local workforce in building the attachment, which is strategically located next to the fire hall and EMS. Mr. Speaker, our government was elected with a strong mandate to rebuild this province. Yep. Whether it's the Clinton OPP detachment, New Groves Memorial Community Spons. Hospital, the expansion of Credit Valley Hospital, or the rebuild of the West Lincoln hey. Memorial Hospital, we will make life better for the people of Ontario. Stop the clock. Thank you. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. We're going to continue along the same line as the question from, from our leader. So all I can say is, here we go again. 
Late Thursday, Mr. Sorry, Speaker, the government announced that Ron Taverner had been chosen as the new Commissioner of the Ontario Provincial Police. Among others, Chris Lewis, the former Commissioner of the OPP, has serious concerns about this appointment, calling it, quote, simply not right and not what's best for the organization, unquote. Like many, he has raised concerns about the new Commissioner, his close relationship with the Premier. Can the acting Premier tell us who was on the selection committee and how they arrived at their selection? Deputy Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. The, uh, through you, Speaker, I think the only accurate part of that question was, yes, on Thursday afternoon, we were proud to announce that Ron Tavner will become the new OPP Commissioner in the province of Ontario. As many of us know, Commissioner, incoming Commissioner has a 50-year history on the front line of policing. All weekend, I have spent answering calls saying from frontline officers saying thank you. You have done exactly what we need. The choice was made by an independent commissioner, and it was uh, approved by cabinet on Thursday. I'm proud of the uh, OPP commissioner, and I'm, I look forward to working with him in the coming years. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That was the answer I expected to get. A no answer. A no answer. When it comes to the keeping families safe and running a police force, Stop the clock. 9, I stopped the clock. Once Restart again, a non answer. Restart the clock. The member can put his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to keeping families safe and running a police force of 9,000 people, the people of Ontario need to know the best person was hired for the job. And when a former OPP commissioner raises serious concerns about the hiring process, they cannot be simply dismissed. They, Mr. Speaker, will the government commit to a transparent and impartial review of the hiring process for this incredibly important job? Minister. Clearly, the member opposite doesn't want to take my word for it, so allow me to share some of the quotes. All right. Bruce Chapman, president of the Ontario Police Association. I've known Superintendent Ron Travner for 30-plus years. He's a hard-working, progressive, and dedicated officer. Ron is a great choice to lead the OPP. Mark Saunders, Chief of Police from the Toronto Public Service. After serving Toronto Police for more than 50 years, there are few people who will leave behind a legacy so rich in community service as Ron Travner. I wish him every success as he begins a new chapter with the OPP. I could go North on Center. and on, but the point is that this independent selection committee made an excellent choice, and we are proud to stand behind him and serve the OPP. Order. Order. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, Ontario is blessed with magnificent forests, lakes and rivers. Those of us who call Ontario home could not ask for a better place to live, work and raise a family. The quality of life enjoyed by our people, as well as the success of our businesses, depend on having clean air to breathe safe water to drink, and well-protected lands and parks. Ontarians recognize the role we play and the responsibility we all share to protect and preserve the province we know and love. Can the minister tell this House what role Ontario has played to ensure we all have a healthy environment to enjoy? The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. 
Mr. Speaker, through you to the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills, thank you for that question. Um, as the member knows, as the House knows, we introduced our Made in Ontario Environment Plan on Thursday. Yeah. And, Mr. Speaker, that plan will ensure that we protect and conserve our air, our water, our land, that we fight climate change, uh, that we reduce litter, urban litter and waste. But, Mr. Speaker, the member is quite right. Ontario has a, has a history in terms of environment. In fact, with regards to climate, Mr. Speaker, Ontario, since 2005, has reduced its emissions by 22 percent. And, Mr. Speaker, this is at the same time as the rest of Canada has increased it by 3 percent. So, Mr. Speaker, the plan that we presented on Thursday, it's a plan that balances a healthy economy and a healthy environment. It does not impose a job-killing tax on, uh, on Ontarians, but it does protect our environment and it does fight climate change. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. S Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister makes some great points about the progress this province has made. Every time we fill up our tanks, we were met with increasing gas prices. Every time we turned up our heat, we knew it would cost us more. Families feel the burden they order. should never have to feel deciding between putting food on their tables and heating their homes. It is time that Ontarians receive some recognition for the sacrifices they have made and the ones they continue to pay for every day. Can the minister highlight for us how our plan focuses on striking the right balance between a healthy environment and a strong economy? Minister. Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, our Made in Ontario plan is a great plan because it was built by Ontarians. Over 8,000 Ontarians contributed. Over 150 stakeholders made contributions to discussions, and we looked at the best global plans in terms of how to approach this. For, for and that's why, West, Mr. Speaker, Dundas, we will be able to say that our plan, through a straightforward, an understandable, a common-sense approach, is going to take Ontario to the Paris targets that our nation agreed to. We will see reductions of 30 percent from 2005 levels by 2030, and our plan is thoughtful. But our plan also deals with litter. Our plan also deals with waste. It deals with pollution in our rivers and lakes. It deals with our air. It deals with excess soil. It deals with the range of issues that Ontarians are concerned about. Again, a plan that balances a healthy economy and a healthy environment. Here, here. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of the Environment. Last week, the government revealed a climate change plan that forces taxpayers to give large emitters millions of public dollars. Instead of making polluters pay, Ontario's taxpayers must now pay the polluters. Wow. How is this fair? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. P Mr. Speaker, our plan strikes a balance. It's a balance that the opposition may not understand, but Mr. Opposition Speaker, our plan in a sensible, common-sense way takes the hard work that Ontarians have put in and adds that additional 8 percent, Mr. Speaker, 8 percent, 18 megatons of greenhouse gas reductions that will get us to the Paris targets that our national government agreed to. Mr. Speaker, for months now, the NDP have talked about a plan and targets and asked us where they are. Mr. Speaker, our plan and our targets are on the table as of Thursday. Where are theirs? Yeah. All right. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the NDP supports climate change action that is fair, effective, and transparent. The Premier's plan is not fair because instead of making polluters pay, the Premier is forcing the people to pay polluters. The plan is not effective because Australia already tried this and it didn't work. Greenhouse gas emissions there are going up, not down. And this plan is not transparent because it has no details about how the Premier will decide which insiders will get these payments. Will the minister withdraw this plan and replace it with a fair, effective and transparent plan that does not force taxpayers to give millions of dollars to big polluters? Minister. Members will please take their seats. Minister. Mr. Speaker, 
our Made in Ontario plan does take the best ideas from around the world, including the New York Green Bank, where we will get $4 of private money for every $1 of public investment, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, for the first time, there will be a comprehensive impact assessment about climate change so we can understand the impacts on communities. And Mr. Speaker, we will work with communities and we'll work with individuals to deal with the impacts of climate change, unlike what the opposition suggests. And Mr. Speaker, as I said, They've been calling for a plan. They've been calling for targets. Our targets are the Paris targets. Our plan is a sensible plan that gets to those reductions. Here, Mr. Here. Speaker, Trano, their plan is a carbon tax. Here, Their's here. plan punishes families. Yeah. Plan $150 a ton, Mr. Speaker. 30 cent increases in gasoline. Door. That's the NDP plan. Yeah. 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 Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Uh, Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker, to be able to ask a question on behalf of my friend from Don Valley East. Member for Ottawa Vanier, seeking unanimous consent of the House to ask a question on behalf of her colleague, the member for Don Valley East. Agreed. 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 Member for Ottawa Vanier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Vice Premier. Or Deputy Premier. As many of my colleagues did, I participated in the protest that took place uh, on Saturday. They account for 4.7 per cent of the population. It seems that 13,000 of them throughout the province took place, it, were in this protest. There were thousands of people members of the National Assembly in Quebec were there to support uh, Francophones here and throughout the country. Francophones have fought many different times throughout their history for what their acquired rights, and they don't want to lose those rights. Will the Premier, Deputy Premier review and reverse the decisions that they've recently made in terms of the elimination of the Commissioner of French Language Services and not to fold it under the Ombudsman? There are no savings, and it risks his independence. And will they continue to commit to, to the Francophone University so that it be open in 2020 and to work with the community to ensure that they continue to fund cultural institutions such as Nouvelle Seine? Hey, General. The Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite is right. Uh, Franco-Ontarians uh, are an integral part of our province, uh, of our history, and of our future. That's why our government has uh, continued its commitment to continue to work with Franco-Ontarians that have worked very hard uh, throughout uh, the generations to uh, ensure the progress of uh, their rights. Uh, during the weekend, there were hundreds, even thousands of Franco-Ontarians that protested, and we listened. We're here as a government to listen and to represent the interests of Franco-Ontarians, and we will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. The measures that we announced won't in any way reverse any of the acquired rights from Franco-Ontarians. We'll continue to protect their language rights and to ensure that our government will be one day able to fund the Francophone University in a concrete manner and a different manner in which the, the previous government had committed to do so. Entry. Madam, La Ministre. Madam Minister, Franco-Ontarian community is ready to protect its rights before the courts. The appeal court in uh, the Lalonde decision has stated that the government cannot reverse uh, acquired rights for linguistic minorities. We have to take into account uh, their interests before implementing administrative decisions. Has the minister taken into account that the judicial risks of these decisions? Why spend money before the courts uh, instead of working with the community and recognize the, the mistakes that were made during the last few weeks? Minister, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the, the member opposite the, whether they thought about the, re, the repercussions of their fiscal de, budgetary decisions when they left a $15 billion deficit for Ontarians to pay of over 300, almost $350 billion. That's where the debt is at. The former government spent a lot of money 
to do a lot in this province, but they didn't ensure the proper funding for the Francophone University. They didn't set that funding aside. We are dedicated to make decisions for all Ontarians. And we're going to put Ontario back on the right path towards prosperity. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you. Is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and, and Mines. Mr. Speaker, our government made a clear, very clear promise to the people of Ontario that we would reduce the price of gasoline. Early on in our mandate, we are delivering on that promise. We took immediate action by scrapping the previous government's cap and trade carbon tax, which has already reduced the price that Ontario families are paying at the pump. And in cap and trade took 4.3 cents a litre off of gasoline and 5 cents a litre off of diesel. But, Mr. Speaker, parts of Northern Ontario are not benefiting from our government's action to reduce gas prices. So, can the minister let the legislature know what he is doing to fix this issue? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, for bringing this issue uh, to light. Mr. Speaker, there's no question that we've taken concrete action uh, to reduce the price per litre of gasoline in the province of Ontario, and many parts of the province have seen that reflected in the price per litre when they go to the gas pumps. And I heed uh, the concerns expressed by my colleagues across the way from Northern Ontario that not all of that has, uh, has translated to our price per litre in Northern Ontario. But in Northwestern Ontario in particular, Mr. Speaker, we have not seen any of these savings. From Thunder Bay West, Mr. Speaker, uh, saw only a drop of a third of that over the same period. It's clear to me uh, that these savings are not being passed on. I'm speaking today not just on behalf of the people from the great uh, Kenora Rainy River uh, districts, Mr. Speaker, but also up in Kiwaitnam, where the prices are grossly distorted and unfair, Mr. Speaker, as they relate to other pricing that goes on in pro province. Our Waterloo. solution is not state intervention as Response. proposed. That has not proven to work for the provinces that use it or the states that have used this model, Mr. Speaker. We're going to stand up for fair price. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for addressing this issue that is so important in the North. I deeply appreciate having a Minister with so much experience standing up for Northern Ontarians' interests. Mr. Speaker, it's incredible that while average prices of gasoline have fallen in the rest of Ontario, Northern Ontario is not benefiting from these reductions. I know the minister will continue to fight for northern communities and make sure everyone in our province benefits from our government's policy decisions. Residents of the north rely on gasoline to drive long distances to work, to put food on the table. They drive their kids to hockey practice. They drive to the grocery store. There are very few alternatives to driving in northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his hard work on this file and ask him what next steps the government is taking to ensure Question. Northerners benefit from lower gas prices. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, is right to point out that in order for our children to travel for competitions and sports and other, other activities, it costs us considerably more mo money to get to those destinations where kids can be exposed to the kind of caliber that others take for granted down here in southern Ontario. And furthermore, it's true, Mr. Speaker, that we've been tracking for the past several months the unfairness in price per litre at the gas pumps, particularly in northwestern Ontario. The state intervention proposed by the member of Timmins has proved to not work for several provinces and the few states that use that. So he can tell the chairman, sorry, the leader of his party, that this is not an effective way to reduce the price per litre of gas. That's why I've called the Competition Bureau in to launch a full investigation into the entire Response. supply chain as it relates to the price of gas in northwestern Ontario. We hope that the Competition Bureau will take this request seriously, Mr. Speaker, and we'll get some answers. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Muskegon, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. Last Saturday, 13,000, 15,000 people gathered to oppose the decision of your government. It's about suppressing the Office of the French Language Services Commissioner as an autonomous organism. Monsieur le Président, 
and the cancellation of the funding of the Francophone University. Mr. Speaker, this is a linguistic crisis. This is an attack towards the franco ontarians There is only one solution. The government must reverse his decisions. Here is my question. Have you listened to the request of the franco ontarians Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his questions. Yes, we are listening to the franco ontarians we, we keep listening to them, and we will keep working for them. We offered last week amendments to Bill 57. We want to reassure franco ontarians that the position of the French Language Services Commissioner relying on the ombudsman will uh, be the way it is. We want to find the best way to protect the rights of Franco-Ontarians while being responsible, fiscally speaking. The commissioner will keep presenting his report to the Legislative Assembly. He will keep his independence from the government. The commissioner will also have the right to give recommendations to improve services. And our government will listen to these recommendations once they're presented by the commissioner. Mr. Speaker, we're here to listen to the franco ontarians Madame la Ministre. Mrs. Minister, on November 26, the Ombudsman of Ontario was interviewed. And there, he says that the franco ontarian community is right to be fearful. In an article, the Ombudsman, and I quote, the Ombudsman admits that his role is not to be the advocate of the Francophonie. As for the cancellation of the funding of the Francophone University, and I'm quoting still, the Ombudsman explains that it's not his place to meddle in this. The words of the Ombudsman are clear, so why do you keep supporting the cancellation of the only office that is able to work independently to support and advocate for the rights of the Franco Ontarians. Le Ministre. Mr. Speaker, we haven't cancelled the office of the French Language Services Commissioner. We will integrate this office in the Ombudsman office. The Commissioner will be able to keep his independence. The current power to make reports and to make recommendations. All the work that is currently done by the commissioner will keep will be, will be done again still uh, through the ombudsman. The linguistic rights will be protected the same way as it is. So I would like the member to stop spreading lies. We will protect the independence of the linguistic rights in Ontario. Thank you. The Attorney General will, will withdraw the parliamentary remark. Order. Order. Thank you. Start the clock. The next question, member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Park. For too long, Ontario families were faced with the process of rising cost of living, as well as skyrocketing energy costs that have hurt our economy and our competitiveness. They are understandably frustrated to see their hard-earned tax dollars being put forward, policies and programs that don't deliver the result. With the passing of the cancellation of Liberal Cap and rate, cap and rate tax, families are finally able to feel some relief. Last week, the minister brought forward his Made in Ontario environmental plan. Can the minister tell the people of Ontario how our government's new plan for the environment will also make life more affordable? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Markham Thornhill for, for his question. But, Mr. Speaker, 
we now have a balanced plan, a plan that balances the economy and the environment. And here, here. To his question, the way that that makes life more affordable for Ontarians is we will hit our Paris targets, we will hit the objectives our country has set, we will reduce greenhouse gases, we will protect the environment, and we will not charge Ontarians a regressive job-killing tax. Mr. Speaker, that we know is going to save Ontarians $264 per family. We know that the Trudeau carbon tax would be $648 by 2022 per, per family. That's why we'll fight that tax. Mr. Speaker, our, also plan, our plan also calls for the increased use of ethanol for cleaner fuels in gasoline, and that will reduce gasoline prices. So, Mr. Speaker, Fox. at every moment, we are balancing an eco the economy and the environment. At every part of our plan, we are making sure that we protect our beautiful environment, but also protect Thank the you. financial health of families. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, for Minister, for that answer. I know my constituents will be happy to hear that our government has kept our promises to not place an unnecessary regressive tax on them. They will be pleased to know that they have the ability to do their part without the burden of a carbon trade tax. The effect of climate change is concerning, and I can assure you, our government takes this concern very seriously. However, this plan is so much more than just climate action. It is a plan for conservation, a plan that will protect our lakes, rivers, land, and air. Can the minister tell the member of this legislature what other concern this plan will to be better to protect our environment? Minister. Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member. He is quite correct. Our plan is an environment plan. It's a plan that deals with clean air, clean water, clean land. It's a plan that does address the vital issue of climate change, Opposition but it also addresses vital issues like water security. Member for Waterloo, it talks come about to order. Sewage in our water, certainly something that I'm sure the NDP cares about. It talks about soil and what we do with excess soil. It talks about our parks and expanding by one million the number of Ontarians and visitors that can enjoy our parks every year. Mr. Speaker, it addresses a range of issues, important environmental issues, including climate change, but not exclusively climate change. Too. Mr. Speaker, these are the issues that Ontarians are worried about. A balanced plan, balancing the environment, the economy, making sure we protect our environment and Order. protect families' pockets. Next question. The member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. A few weeks ago, Regional Senior Justice Peter Daly uh, addressed the courts to bring attention to the abysmal state of Brampton Court facilities. Daly stated, and I'll quote, the Ontario government, past and present, is either willfully blind to the erosion of trust caused by its failure to take timely steps to address the facilities crisis in Brampton, or it believes that spending on this courthouse will not result in more votes. Since the minister declined an invitation from Mr. Daly to hear his remarks and to tour the courthouse in Brampton, is the minister willing to visit the courthouse to learn how firsthand chronically underfunded facilities in our city are blocking access to justice? The Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question and for the invitation. I uh, am looking forward to touring the Brampton courthouse. In uh, February last year, construction commenced on a six-story addition uh, to the Brampton Courthouse. We are taking a fiscally responsible approach to the Brampton addition, where the basement first and second floors will be completed now to address immediate needs, while the remaining floors will be fit, up to, will be fit at a future date. The previous Liberal, go Liberal government, as you know, Mr. Speaker, left us with a $15 billion Didn't deficit they? and $340 billion in debt for us to pay back. We were, were given a mandate from the people of Ontario to clean up the financial yes, mess, we and we are working to do so while finding ways to deliver efficient and effective yep. services to meet the needs of Ontarians. The ministry will continue to review and respond to the facility needs of the Brampton Courthouse as we move forward, and I look forward to touring the courthouse. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the Minister. Uh, you know, my colleagues and I uh, from Brampton on both sides of this House are uh, very proud of our fast-growing city, but we all acknowledge that our city uh, needs the services to grow with us. I have personally heard stories about serious cases being stayed or even dismissed because the courtrooms are not available or trial dates cannot be secured in a timely manner. The government has failed to address the lack of resources to the courts in Brampton, and we are witnessing significant impacts to our justice system. What is the minister willing to do to ensure that the people of Brampton and people across the region appeal have timely access to justice? Minister. As I said, we are, we are uh, building the process of constructing a, a new courthouse in Brampton to address this issue. Access to justice for people of Brampton and people across this province is a priority for our government. And so while the government has left us with a fiscal mess to clean up, we're trying to find other approaches to improve access to justice, including investing in technology and finding other ways to make sure that Ontarians can access courts and services they need. Mr. Mr. Speaker, this is what we have been doing on, since we were elected on day one. We will continue to do that, and addressing the, the, uh, the facilities needs in this province is part of that plan. And as I said, I look forward to, to uh, spending time in Brampton and touring the courthouse with the members. Well, Start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. My question is to the Honourable Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last week, the Parliamentary Budget Officer tabled his report detailing the costing of irregular migration across Canada's southern border. The PBO estimates that the average cost for each irregular migrant will rise to an average of $16,666 next year. Wow. This amounts to a total variable cost of $340 million this year and is projected to rise to $396 million next year. Unbelievable. These figures only account for the costs incurred by the federal government, not the provincial government. Can the minister please tell us when Ontario expects to be reimbursed question. by the federal Liberal government's failed border policies? Good question. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I am so delighted that we have this uh, question on the floor of the Assembly. I only wish it had come from the opposition, who be as diligent in, uh, in their work as the member uh, from our party. Because what happened last week is the Order. parliamentary budget officer and the Toronto Street Needs Survey validated what this government has been saying since June 29th, that because of the illegal border crossing in Quebec, there was substantial pressure on our shelter system in the city of Toronto, which is 40 per cent, which is what our Senator number has been, and there is substantial pressure on our provincial government. The parliamentary budget officer validated our $200 million and growing costs in the province of Ontario. We are simply asking the Minister of Immigration and the Prime Minister to make us whole, as every single Premier in every single province and territory has suggested when they stood side by side with our Premier. What's also Response. troubling is the fact that the, Premier, the, the parliamentary budget Budget officer suggested this is going to cost taxpayers a billion dollars just for the federal government alone. Wow. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, that wasn't the only discouraging report released last Thursday. The City of Toronto also released findings from their street needs assessment, which surveyed the city's homelessness back in April. The findings clearly show that the city's shelter system is struggling to meet the increased demand and that roughly 40 per cent of occupants identify as refugees or asylum seekers. Wow. I imagine other municipalities across the province are facing the same predicament. Minister, how are Ontario's West, homeless shelters order. expected to operate under this added strain as the temperature falls? Good question. Wish Paul Mil Minister. Important question, one that I've recently met with both Mayor Tory and Mayor Watson in our two largest cities, who have said that their, their capacity is at 40 per cent. I want to be perfectly clear. The federal minister of immigration may like to call people names when they disagree with them, but the facts 
don't lie. In fact, we know, for example, that the ministry, that, that, that the Toronto Needs Survey validated Opposition our number. Order. The parliamentary budget officer has validated our number. So what I'd like to see from Prime Minister Trudeau is a tweet and a pledge for the $200 million he owes here, here. us, so Opposition we can ensure that our homelessness holiday season get the support they need in our. Again, I apologize to the minister for having to cut her off in mid-sentence when her colleagues rose when the standing volume of the standing ovation was such that I could not hear her. I had to cut her off. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Uh, this is to the Minister of Transportation. Last week, the government quietly released the terms of reference for their plan to break up Toronto's subway system and take it away from Torontonians. While this government has been cagey about their plans for our subway, the document clearly lays out an agenda for selling off and privatising this valuable public asset. Then on Friday, we learned that the government, government is demanding the order. City of Toronto tell the province how much the TTC is worth. Step one for selling off a public asset is to determine how much it's worth. Will the minister come clean and tell the public that their plan for Toronto's subway system has been to break it up and sell it off. The Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much uh, from the member opposite for that question. And, and Speaker, we have no intention of breaking up and privatizing selling off the TTC. What we're going to do is what should have been done long ago is to create the regional structure that this province needs by getting Toronto Opposition moving. The best order. way to do that is to work with the City of Toronto to look at uploading the system. Right now we have a special advisor appointed at the end of August, Michael Lindsay, who has been working with stakeholders in Toronto to see which is the best way forward. He's come forward with a plan to put forward, which I addressed in my letter to the Mayor John Tory. I've spoken to Mayor Tory. He's all for working together. We're going to work together with City Council. We're going to come together with a plan that works not only for the Toronto but the GTHA as a whole. And if you get that region rolling, Mr. Speaker, you get the province rolling and, and opening up Ontario for business. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, Toronto built the subway. Toronto taxpayers and transit riders pay for the subway, and Torontonians govern the subway. It's ours, not yours, to sell. Breaking up the subway. Breaking up, I was. Breaking up the subway and selling off parts of it will not help overcrowding or delays, nor will it make fares more affordable. On the contrary, we have seen from other privatised transit lines that fares are set for what's good for the service provider and not what's affordable for the rider. What Torontonians want to see from this government is investment in transit to make their commutes shorter and fares more affordable, not a $1.4 billion cut to transit infrastructure. Will the minister do the right thing, listen to the experts and riders, and stop this wrong-headed decision to break up Toronto's subway? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, again, thanks for that supplemental from the member opposite. And, and unfortunately, uh, it was missing quite a bit of, uh, of actual data that uh, has been coming forth. So let me be clear. I'll be crystal clear that the TTC will run and operate the subways. And we have requested a lot of data from the TTC and the city and Metrolinx to figure out what's the best way forward, and that will be coming forward. Uh, Mr. Speaker, listen, after the upload is completed, we are going to do to, for Toronto and the regional system. We're going to grow it. We Member are going for to build University the Rosedale, come to We are going to build the Young Extension. We're going to build out subways out to uh, Tobacco. Mr. Speaker, we are going to grow the Grow Transit system. We are going to get this province going from the GTHA down to downtown uh, Toronto. Yeah, once again, I'll acknowledge that some of the members are very enthusiastic and want to demonstrate their um, agreement with a, a member who has the floor, perhaps, a minister answering a question. But once I cannot hear the minister's response because of the volume of the standing ovation, I have to stand up and interrupt the minister in, in mid-sentence. Next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
Our government is working hard to make sure the whole world knows that Ontario is now open for business. Yeah. We are taking action so that our province can once again regain its place as the economic engine of Canada. But, Mr. Speaker, in order to do so, it's important Position that our government foster international relationships to encourage investment in Ontario. Last week, we were happy to hear that our Minister of Finance visited New York City. Could the minister please explain the purpose of his trip and what he accomplished while he was there? Yeah. Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Thornhill. Last week, we were thrilled to let the investment community in New York City know that Ontario is open for business. We spoke with the Canadian Association of New York about fostering a culture of innovation in our province and nurturing an attractive investment climate. We also discussed our government's plan for lower taxes, smarter spending, and deficit reduction with international investors. And we made clear that for the first time in 15 years, Ontario's government wants to work with the business community. Yes. After our trip to New York, everyone across Ontario can be excited for the success that lies ahead because Ontario is open for business. Stop the clock. At the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. We're all very excited to hear about the success the Minister and his team had in spreading the message that Ontario was open for business. Yep. It is only by sharing the hard work everyone in our government is doing that we will be able to attract the investment Ontario needs to get moving again. Indeed, it's been a long time since the business community saw this level of support from Ontario's government. Mr. Speaker, our government has taken action to open Ontario to investment with plans to continue fostering an attractive business environment. Could the minister share the details of our Open for Business message and how the actions of our government have resonated with the investment community? Yeah, yeah. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, our Open for Business approach was warmly received by the investment community in New York. In fact, they said our message was the best they've heard in 15 years. We were able to share that cap-and-trade carbon tax is no longer punishing businesses in our province. We promoted our decision to parallel the federal changes to the accelerated capital cost allowance, which makes business investments more attractive in Ontario. And we once again committed to cutting red tape by 25 per cent by 2022 in order to make doing business in Ontario easier. Speaker, we are restoring confidence in Ontario as the best place to invest and do business. Yeah. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Today is International Day for People with Disabilities, and as I pose this question, Speaker, I want to acknowledge in the Speaker's Gallery some of our friends from the disability rights community. Thank you for being here. Speaker, today is a day that should be reminding us that our province is on a deadline. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Pardon me, Speaker. We're on a deadline, Speaker. The Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act has to be set in place with a legitimate plan by 2025. But every disability rights leader and organization I've met has told us that we're way behind in meeting that objective. Does the minister believe that we're on track to have a fully accessible province by 2025? The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you so much. You know, I, uh, I'm really glad that you've asked this question because my colleague, the Minister for uh, Seniors and Accessibility, has been working full out on these issues, and actually he's away today doing a speech on this very, um, the, this very issue. It's important that we work with all of our stakeholders. We need to make sure that we have the most open and accessible province, but we need to do it in a reasonable way that makes sure that no one gets hurt along the way. So we're working with stakeholders, we're working with the accessibility uh, citizens, and we're making sure that we're getting it right. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Deputy Premier. Uh, achieving full accessibility, according to experts that I've talked to, it requires two things, a commitment and a plan. But right now, 
Three out of five AODA standards committees, which actually are doing the work about accessible and inclusive health care and education for people living with a disability, their work has been frozen since the election. It's one thing to say we support accessibility, but it's another thing to actually make it a priority by putting those AODA committees to work. So my question is very simple. Will the minister unfreeze the committees? And will, work, will, they, will the minister work with people with disabilities to develop a multi-year accessibility plan so Ontario is fully accessible by 2025? Minister. There is no doubt, Speaker, that everyone in Ontario deserves to fully participate in our lives, in everyday lives. And that includes recreation, that includes our workforce, that includes our families, our schools, our, our justice system. But we need to do it in a reasonable and measured way. That is what my colleague is doing. That is what he's doing. And we will make sure that work gets done, but we need to make sure that the stakeholders are involved and engaged in the process. Thank you. Next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment. Our government is working hard to grow our economy Video. while protecting the environment. While the Prime Minister of Canada imposes a carbon tax on workers and families, our government is restoring hope and affordability for our people. I'm proud of our Minister of Environment and proud of his Made in Ontario solution. We are proud of our plan to ensure clean air and water and conservation of our natural heritage. Oops. Can our minister confirm that our plan will help reduce emissions while growing our economy? Mr. Speaker, uh, before I begin, let me just commend the member from Burlington for her question, but also her, um, her, her promotion there now as the PA for the Minister of Labour. So, Mr. Speaker, as, as the member referenced, um, importantly, in getting rid of cap and trade, we saved Ontarians $260. That's money in their pockets. But, but in addition to that, we now have provided a plan, a plan that balances the economy and the environment, a plan that makes sure that we reduce greenhouse gases in a sensible way, that takes advantage of, of, the, of the sacrifices Ontarians have already made to make Ontario the leading reduct, reducing province, 22 per cent since 2005, Mr. Speaker, to, but to get us that latest 8 per cent to the national, international Order. targets we've agreed to and make sure that we balance the health of the economy, the environment. Response. We meet our objectives. We have a healthy environment as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Minister, thank you for your kind words. Uh, Minister, our plan, our Made in Ontario plan, will ensure that polluters are held accountable with stronger enforcement, a plan that is tailored to address Ontarians' unique environmental and economic challenges. And, Speaker, a plan that does not include a carbon tax on working families in this province. Speaker, it's time we made life affordable. It's time government is part of the solution, not the problem. Speaker, can the minister outline the benefit of our Made in Ontario plan and how it will ensure we leave the next generation better off? Minister. Mr. Speaker, our Made in Ontario climate plan does include a plan for climate change. It does include the Ontario Carbon Trust, which will use the best models internationally to, to, to reduce greenhouse gases. It, 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 it understands the benefits of conservation in the area of natural gas. It talks about cleaner fuels, but it also talks about other things, Mr. Speaker. It talks about cleaner water. It talks about being clear and transparent, whether it's about sewage in our water or air pollution in our air. Mr. Speaker, it is a broad-based plan that deals with litter and waste. It deals with the Blue Box program and how we move from 30 per cent diversion to a higher level of diversion. Mr. Speaker, it's a comprehensive plan. It's a plan that balances the economy and the environment. Here, here. That concludes our time for question period today. I'm advised that we have a former member visiting us in the House today. The member for Middlesex from the 36th Parliament, Mr. Bruce Smith, is here with us today. Welcome. Member for King Vaughan and a point of order. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of my colleague, the House Leader, I'd like to recognize the family of Paige Keaton Singer, today's Page Captain. And if you permit me, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to, see, to seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice regarding sign language interpretation for statements by the ministry this afternoon. I move that sign language interpreters may be present on the floor. So, uh, first of all, I have to seek. You're seeking unanimous consent of the House to allow sign language interpreters uh, in the House this afternoon for the, for the minister's statement. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you, Speaker. I move that sign language interpreters may be present on the floor of the chamber today to interpret statements by the ministry and responses. I think the House has agreed to the request that you're making, and we thank you very much for that. Point of order, the member for Burlington, Oakville, Oakville, Burlington. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also wanted to recognize the family of Paige Ram and Apalagan who are here with us today, Alligan and Arun and Apalagan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.